Hi, everyone. Welcome to your podcast, New Books in Economic and Business History. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. And today I have the great pleasure to be with Brad DeLong. He's professor of economics at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, he served as deputy assistant secretary of the U.S. Department of the Treasury in the Clinton administration. And he's the author of Slouching Towards Utopia, an economic history of the 20th century. It's a book that is going to uh, be released pretty soon. We're going to be talking today with him about his career and, and his book. How are you, Brad? Thanks a lot for being here. I am excellent. I am here. I am starting the marketing and media push for the book. And my task now is to generate organic community buzz about the book before its September 6th publication date which is a highly oxymoronic assignment that the community buzz I'm supposed to generate is supposed to be organic, but I'm also supposed to generate it. And I'm puzzling how to do this. It's going to be fine. I mean, you're probably going to be pretty busy for a few weeks, but uh, I mean, the book is Uh good enough and I'm sure you're not going to need to make a huge effort to find people interested in it. Okay. Yes. Uh, Would you mind if we start talking about um, your origin? So you've had a very exciting career, right? Not only Mm -hmm. as a very successful scholar, but you've been involved in uh, public Mm -hmm. policy. You've been active in in the public discussion. Where are you from? How did you end up being interested in economics and economic history? How did you end up following this specific path that is not super common among, among scholars? And is there a key moment? Um, I'd actually say there are probably three key moments. Um, In the middle of them comes being in, you know, eighth grade or maybe ninth grade, no, eighth grade, and my parents deciding I needed something to actually do over the summer and me not wanting to and no longer going to tennis camp on the grounds that tennis camp in the middle of the day in Washington, D.C. in July and August seems actually awful. Um, So my father got me a summer internship with a friend of his, Roger Wadd, who then was an economist at the Federal Reserve. And so I spent the summer programming Fortran um, in an attempt to build a model of the short-term money market. Um, where I was simply writing essentially do loops and then seeing if everything ran. But it was very interesting, and it seemed to be a kind of fun job that one could do that played to some of my strengths. Before then, um, before then, there comes the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting in Washington, D.C. at some point in which I went down as a pre-teenager and found that in the basement along the exhibits, they had a teletypewriter hooked up to a computer someplace that was running Jay Forster's World Dynamics model. Now, the World Dynamics model, it has the property that pollution is a stock variable. And so as society pollutes, the stock of pollution grows. And it is the stock of pollution that has a strongly negative effect on productivity with a lag. And you see that and you know immediately that that is the kind of model that is going to produce horrific crashes, right? You produce, you pollute, um, you produce more, you pollute some more, production grows, but the pollution stock is growing and it's growing faster. And then eventually the pollution stock begins reducing your production. But since the pollution stock is still growing and since the F does an effect on productivity with a lag, it kills your productivity over the next generation. So the model always produced runs with things like horrific human die-offs from 15 billion down to 1 billion and immense impoverishments of the world no matter what you did. But I was absolutely fascinated. Um with the ability for me to set up scenarios and run them and peer into the future. Um, All of this conditional on the model being right, but still it seemed to me that this was a very exciting and important thing to do. 
um, had the possibility of being the key to the riddle of history. Um, and then the third moment was trying to figure out what to do after college and having a number of options and then realizing that the unemployment rate was going to be 11% when I graduated in 1982, which meant staying into the inside the university seemed a good thing to go into the job market later on. Um, and noticing that people who were applying for assistant professorships in history and social studies were all 40 and had written two books, and people who were applying for jobs as assistant professors of economics and social studies were all 25 and had one half written paper and a letter from their advisor saying the paper's a mess, but he's really, really brilliant. Mm -hmm. Deciding that clearly economics is the PhD to get for supply and demand reasons. And so I did that and I actually never got out onto the job market. Um, you know, I applied for one series of jobs in the economics. Um, Died of job market, but then afterwards I've never applied for a job. Well, I've never had to search for one. And so lo and behold, here I am. That's very interesting. You know, it's kind of, kind of funny that you describe how scholars frequently are not exposed to the job market and, and they become the adv advisors of younger scholars that are a good part of their job is helping them to navigate uh, uh, yeah, and this market. is a problem, right? This is a problem. You know, I went on the job market once, um, but then in the middle of the process, you know, um, I got a call from MIT saying, we don't want to offer you an assistant professorship, but come and be a lecturer next year, and maybe we'll offer you an assistant professorship afterwards, which they did not. Um and so that was my short circuiting, uh, my job market then. Yeah. And then yeah, after so that year, then, yeah. um, well, MIT didn't want to keep me as an assistant professor, but um, my wife wanted to take, do her clerkship in Boston. So I called up Larry Kotlikoff and said, you know, um, mm -hmm. I'm going to be here next year without a job. Um, and he said, well, then immediately come and be an assistant professorship at Boston University. Um, and then at Boston University, you know, I was there for a couple of years and then Harvard called and said, come <laughs> back and be an assistant professor. Then when the Clinton administration started, they said, come down here and be a deputy assistant secretary of the treasury. Um, then, you know, then Berkeley called and said, come out here with tenure and lo and behold, here I am. Yeah. The, it was a very was... different age. It was a very different age. Universities were still expanding and people hadn't really glommed onto the fact that economists with PhDs were not just going to academic institutions, but were going to central banks and to kind of business schools and to the private sector as well. So, you know, um, demand for assistant professors was extremely high and supply was quite limited. But I mean, this idiosyncratic like elements that you describe in your story, which I think are very interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I think that they're still there. And I actually want to I'll, I'll mention this there, year. I was but talking, much, uh, much, but much, much less favorable to a young person. Right, right. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, but I wanted to tell you that I was talking about the same thing with uh, Chris Blattman recently here. And and he brought you up. So he was like telling me about yes. his career and he describing a certain way how he ended up being an economist kind of because of you. The way in which he framed the story was that it was mm -hmm. kind of a lost kid trying to figure out what he wanted to do and he applied to Berkeley and because you were there and you sort of saw something interesting in his profile, uh, uh -huh. he ended up um, becoming an, an economist. Okay. So um, I wanted to ask you like regarding that story, what like, what do you see in young scholars? Like, uh, I mean, I'm not going to ask you exactly what you saw in Chris at the moment, but in general, when 
someone approach, approaches you saying, you know, I want to be an economic historian or an, an economist, um, what do you see like, what, what are those signals of talent or, um, or, or how, how do you deal with that like mentorship, like, like part, like that well, part of mentorship? Well, I kind of think omnivorous curiosity and also the ability to get things done. Right. I mean, John Maynard Keynes put this perhaps best in his obituary for his teacher, Alfred Marshall, where he said that an, a very good economist is a bad mathematician and a lousy historian and a person who kind of has a dilettante's interest in the daily news and in the flow of kind of accounting. So how is it that none of the pieces of economics are terribly difficult or are done at a terribly difficult level, but that first-class economists are incredibly rare? And the answer is you need the combination, um, that you need very much a combination of the ability to move back and forth between the Marshallian mathematical framework and the current flow of data and history, but with appropriate knowledge of the underlying sociological structures that inform and shape markets. And someone with an ability to move back and forth among those four and integrate them and also manage to get anything finished, you know, is quite rare. And that's what you pretty much have to look for. Um, you know, that there are lots of people who are okay at math, but they have very little idea what the math is for. Um, with Berkeley, with Berkeley, someone should only come to Berkeley if... Let me put it this way, right? That in the University of Chicago Economics Department, an introductory economics course was 14 weeks on how markets are great. And one week at the end about market failures, but, you know, the market failures are there, mm -hmm. but government failures, if we try to correct them, will be worse. Um, at Berkeley, it's three weeks um, on market success, seven weeks on market failure, and three weeks on how a clever Berkeley economist can design a series of government interventions that will make things much, 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 much better. And, you know, if you're not comfortable um, with that view of the world, you're going to be working against the grain at Berkeley. And so you probably won't do that well here. Um, I mean, that's kind of my view. Dude, I mean, you were mentioning before how the, <clears throat> the system has changed and is less favorable for uh, those graduating mm -hmm. from PhDs. But mm -hmm. how, do you feel that it has changed also on the other side of the distribution. I mean, like people getting into the PhDs. I have the impression that now um, applicants to PhDs have a much more tied education and there's this whole conversation on the computer about how important or not it is to have previous training on real analysis or things like that for applying for a PhD in economics. Do you think that that has changed? Do you think that that's going the right or wrong direction? Well, you know, I mean, we had real analysis in our day. You know, I mean, I remember sitting next to Andre Schleifer in Andreo Muscalet's class, learning about upper hemicontinuity um, and similar things. And when exactly the market equilibrium would exist and when it would fail because, you know, the point of the set where the equilibrium would have been was just not there. Um. I'm trying to figure out how to relate this to kind of the world outside. Um, these concepts of equilibrium and equilibrium failure and do you know, the exact geometric structure of the space in which we're searching for an equilibrium. Not in the end coming to any particularly great answers, although I found Frank Fisher's Disequilibrium Foundations of Equilibrium Economics to be truly excellent in showing you know, that not just the basic math, but that the advanced math could truly, truly be very useful and powerful. Um, 
we had that, we might not have had enough of that. Um, what we did not have were the computer programming skills and the big data manipulation skills and the API skills. And what we did have was that, you know, dissertation topics were simply on the ground. You turn around and you find a dissertation topic that urgently needs to be done. You know, well, now it's much more, you have to take something that someone else has done and figure out a way to do it significantly better and at significantly better, bigger scale. Um, and, you know, the world is a bigger place with many, many, many more people qualified, lucky enough to be qualified to apply for the PhD programs as they're structured. And yet they really have not grown over the past 50 years, in large part because, you know, American tenured professor ranks have not grown um, over the past 50 years. And universities outside the United States have not scaled up massively on the American system. Right. It that's, may in that's... some ways be the difference between a fast growing young society that's rapidly expanding um, in the global North and an aged gerontocracy approaching secular and other forms of stagnation in which the people who want your jobs are old and are hanging on to them for dear life. That's that's very interesting, and actually, that's a, that's something I want to ask you about uh, yeah. related to to your book, and, and probably this is a good good moment to move into that. Um, so your book is a a story of the twentieth century, right? And mm -hmm. you mean by the twentieth century something very specific? I'm going to ask you about that in a bit, but before that, I. I would like to ask you if you like why paying attention to the 20th century. And I'm asking you this because <clears throat> um, economic history has moved in the last decade or so further in time to trying to understand why the world today looks as it is, right? So before everything was uh, supposed to be understood in the Industrial Revolution. Um, but we're increasingly trying to argue that the forces behind the Industrial Revolution were in the 18th, 17th, 16th century. And again, I feel that economic history is doing increasingly more um, ancient history, if you want. And I'm even a bit uh, guilty of, of that scene. Do you feel that your book is a sort of reaction to that? Or why were you so Very interested definitely. in the 20th century? Very definitely. Right. That, you know. I mean, there was the idea, and I suppose it really was developed you know, in, say, around 1900 in the British Empire and then transferred to America after World War II, um, that we are the height and the culmination of civilization and are everything good. And, you know, we got here by this complicated process, which means that we have immense amounts to teach other people in the world about how they should become like us and do this as fast as possible and as completely as possible. And that really is the only road. Um, you see this in, say, Marx and Engels, where they say the more advanced country shows to the less advanced the image of its own future. Um, that you need to copy and assimilate um, and become us. Down to people in Singapore wearing three-piece English wool business suits, which are designed for living in October in a place without central heating that's incredibly wet and cold. Um, and, you know, it's, you start from this kind of presupposition as to how we got here and who we are, and then historians start chasing it back. And they say, no, wait a minute. Um, we have representative institutions in Castile in the 1200s, if not in the Burgundian tribes in 450. And we have things that look an awful lot like market exchange and a sophisticated capitalist commercial division of labor, not just in Britain in the 1700s and not just in Holland in the 1500s, but it really looks like Baghdad in the 800s or indeed back to the Phoenicians in minus 900. Um, 
the disenchantment of the world, the belief that there are logical and systematic relationships that you can discover by experiment, um, goes back to Archimedes, if not well, well before, back to the Babylonians who figured out that they, if you had a um, cord that had 12 equally spaced knots in it, you could construct a right triangle from that and make sure that all your stones were square. And so as you push things back, you find that all of the pieces of what was supposed to be, quote, advanced Western civilization, unquote, come from before. Thus, historians move back further into the past and they find earlier industrial revolutions, earlier commercial revolutions, earlier scientific revolutions. They find that Hero of Alexandria's tenure piece for his attempt to become librarian of Alexandria is in fact a primitive steam engine. Um, and you know, so it appears to be much more a very long march um, of economic, technological, and cultural development. And I wanted to say, no, that's really not the case at all. The right way to view it is that we were in a Malthusian trap, you know, up until 1870 or so, or maybe a little bit earlier, maybe not. And if you're in a Malthusian trap, um, well, A, almost everyone is desperately poor, and B, um, the overwhelming direction of elite activity in a society won't be figuring out how to make things more productive, but instead making, figuring out how me and my family can get enough by participating in the exploitation and extraction force and fraud regime that the upper class runs on society as a whole. Um, a whole bunch of things are necessary to get us to a situation in which we're no longer there. You know, maybe the British Industrial Revolution, the figuring out how to use stored sunlight in the form of coal as a massive technological energy source would have done it. But, you know, we were running out of really cheap coal by the 1860s or so. All the places where the last glaciers had scraped all the rock off above the Permian level. Um, we'd found them all and we dug them out. And to get more coal would require going deeper through lots of nasty rock. But around 1870, we get modern science um, appears to discover new regularities. We get the industrial research lab to rationalize and routinize not just the discovery, but the development of new technologies. We get the modern corporation to rationalize and routinize not just the development, but then the deployment um, of new technologies. And we get full globalization. Um, every single port in the world being, economically speaking, right next to every other one. So that then the enormous incentives to deploy and then to figure out how to copy and thus diffuse technologies become absolutely overwhelming. You know, and so the rate of technological progress in the world, which had kind of tripled with the commercial revolution era and then doubled again with the industrial revolution era, um, it again multiplies itself more than fourfold in 1870. And so after that, Malthus had no chance. Our technological capabilities were doubling every generation. We were well on the way to being rich enough and to, for females to have enough social power that we were on the way to the demographic transition. And we could, for the first time, have a rich society, but also a society that technological and hence economic underpinnings and thus sociological, political, and cultural superstructures we're being revolutionized and upended every generation. Um, and so the fact that we could be a rich world, but also that our entire society was being overwhelmed and overturned every single generation, and we had to build new institutions on the fly if we weren't going to kill each other off, um, those are the key things about the 20th century, and those make it very different from all previous centuries all of which are you know, in the Malthusian trap to greater or lesser degrees. Let, let me ask you about that. I'm like, 
feel in your answer you already anticipate some of the reasons behind it but why focusing on what you call the long 20th century right you want to tell one specific story there in contrast to other stories right and yeah. uh, that long century implies that it's not uh, the hundred years but why does it start before and why does it end later what what what's the story you want to tell there well you know it really <coughs> i mean i suppose that if i have a key marker it's john stuart mill's declaration at the start of the 1870s that hitherto all the mechanical inventions have not improved the life of the working class, that they've simply enabled a greater number of people to live the same life of drudgery and imprisonment as far as the overwhelming bulk of humanity of the working class is concerned. You know, that we still had worldwide, on average, the typical politics of near Malthusian poverty on the one hand and elite exploitation. Um, on the other, as of 1870. But between 1870 and 1914, it clearly was no longer the case. You know, there never had been anything like the upward leap in worldwide productivity and living standards that we saw between 1870 and 1914. Like, say... Um, the Nigerian author, Igbo Niger, Nigerian author Chinua Achebe, um, his first great book, Things Fall Apart, you know, the, his viewpoint characters looking at the colonial intrusion from Britain, that the reaction of the big people in the village is, you know, the white man has brought nasty weapons and a really crazy religion. Uh, but now there is a market. And our nuts and our oil have never come being able to command such a price and give us so many good things you know, ever in the past in the world. And that 1870 to 1914, that economic El Dorado, as John Maynard Keynes would call it, has indeed set the pattern for everything that's happened since. You know, enormous increases in wealth that are relatively widely distributed. And how is society going to deal with the possibilities and also the problems opened up there. Um, and to start the story anywhere else is to miss kind of that key transition point. So in striking contrast to stories that want to begin the 20th century in 1914 or in 1919, that then focus on something else and that miss the fact that the big story of the 20th century is that every generation we are technologically twice as capable as we were the generation before, and we have to construct societal institutions to deal with this and to take advantage of this. And so you look at histories of the short 20th century, and they all mostly miss this. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, Eric Hobsbawm in his Age of Extremes at some point turns around and says, yo, wait a minute, I'm I've been talking about war and class struggle and resistance and so forth. And yet somehow in 1980, all at least the North Atlantic, all the way through to Moscow is now extraordinarily rich and has extraordinarily high life expectancies relative to all previous civilizations. And you know, I haven't spent that many pages on how this happened, except except a few when I minimize the differences between the industrialization process in Western Europe and in Eastern mm -hmm. Europe, which is a, another quarrel I have with them, but let's not go to that. Um, and similarly, stories that say the key thing is the industrial revolution in itself is the coming of steam power and automatic textile machinery to England in the 1700s, miss the fact that that really did not matter for how much your average person ate until after 1870. Um, let me ask you, so you mentioned John Stuart Mill, you mentioned Keynes, um, but someone that you haven't brought up yet that seems to have been particularly influential <clears throat> in your 
um, intentions to write this book is Polanyi, right? Yes. Um, could you yes. tell? And and we, in our profession, we hear much less of Polanyi than of Keynes, no. of course, but even Mill, right? So who was Polanyi and why was he important? And why did he inspire you in a certain way to to write this book or to develop the ideas well, that you put in the book? That actually is because everything else is left on the cutting room floor. Right? That if you want to think of a chorus, say, um, of people who are guiding my thinking, of people who I've read their books and, you know, from the black marks on the page, I've spun up subterranean instantiations of their minds that I then run in separate sandboxes on my own wetware and are kind of whispering to me. Um, that there's Karl Polanyi's younger brother, Michael Polanyi, who is whispering to me about modern science as a fiduciary institution and on its key importance. Um, there is Václav Smil talking about the details of the technologies and how they were actually applied and deployed. And alongside him, my old teacher, David Landis, doing the same. There is um, Joseph Schumpeter talking about technology, finance, industrial structure. Um, at a layer higher than Schumpeter, there is you know, John Maynard Keynes talking about macroeconomics and economic possibilities for our grandchildren and the euthanization of the rentier. And then there is Friedrich von Hayek with his glorious, glorious insight on how the market as a mercenary institution is extraordinarily effective at crowdsourcing solutions to problems that it is allowed to set itself. You know, that you want the true crowdsourcing, you know, it's the market. And yes, Hayek picked this up from Michael Polanyi, but he expressed it better. And then at the next level, there is Karl Polanyi saying, wait a minute. Um, the von Hayekian market says the only form of social power is wealth, which comes from property rights and which comes from property rights that are worth something. And if your only form of social power is to own valuable property rights, well, then the fabric of your life, you know, the community you live in, um, your ability to command an income corresponding to what you think you deserve, um, the ability of other people to have the incomes that you think they deserve, and, you know, the stability, the, your ability to kind of have the life this year you had last year. All of those depend on those things satisfying some maximum profitability test carried out by some rootless cosmopolite financier 3,000 miles away who has never seen them. And in an environment in which you have Schumpeterian creative destruction, doubling the technological capability of humanity every generation, all that is solid is going to melt into air. Um... Everything you have about is going to be dissolved at the whim of those who have the social power that is wealth. And, you know, humans simply will not stand with that. Humans believe there are other sources of social power than wealth and that they ought to be recognized. And if the market won't recognize them, they will make political and military and revolutionary movements to make that happen. And so... I needed a grand narrative, right? That the book has to have on every page an interesting anecdote to make you sit up. And it also needs to have enough of a narrative thrust though, so that you want to turn the page to say what happens next. But a good book will only hold together, not just if it has arresting anecdotes and narrative thrust. There also needs to be a grand narrative into which you can slot everything. You know, um, and, you know, grand narratives are false, but you need them. Um, we're narrative loving animals. And um, I needed the least false grand narrative I could think of. And it was this dialectic between von Hayek and Polanyi. You know, von Hayek saying the market giveth, the market taketh away. Blessed be the name of the market. That's the best we can do. Polanyi saying, um, wait a minute, the market was made for man, not man for the market. 
And so that's why as it went through drafts, as my editors hammered me more and more on what is the single grand narrative thread that will actually make people read the book and feel like they've learned something from it. Um, Polanyi began to take on more and more of a spot and the rest, you know, um, Keynes, Schumpeter, Landis, Mill, you know, um, Michael Polanyi, and so on, receded into the background. For which I am sorry, and I have hopes for follow-up books um, about giving them back their place, but we'll see. Let, let's continue with like that brand narrative and with the title of the book that is louching towards utopia, right? So your book gives the <clears throat> the impression that we're just getting to this um, beautiful society in which uh, this uh, human desire towards uh, justice probably was getting closer and somehow um, that uh, benchmark is getting further away. Um, and I guess what I want to ask you is, how realistic do you think that that utopia, although this could be a silly question as an utopia is in theory never fully feasible, how would that be a, a realistic environment, right? Like, do you think that we would ever be able to get there? Um, how do you think about that process of... I yeah, think our ahead. predecessors would be really, really surprised that we haven't, right? That, you know, well, I mean... You know, can go back to Aristotle, right? And Aristotle saying the most important part of economics is figuring out is the is slave management, is figuring out how to effectively boss your slaves. And that this will be true always. For you would have to have, you know, the robot blacksmiths of Hephaestus. Um, or, oh no, of Daedalus, or the self-propelled catering carts, serving carts of Daedalus. You would have to have lyres that would play by themselves and looms that would weave without a human hand moving the shuttle. If you were going to ever be able to get away from large-scale slavery as the basis of human society, that exploitation and extraction have got to be it, simply because productivity is so low relative to natural resources and numbers. Um, and so previous societies are not only poor, but they're also vicious in the sense that some have enough only by taking through force and fraud by others. Um, and you know, that was the way it was. Um, they'd look at us and they say, wait a minute, you have. Um, you have not only musical instruments that play by themselves, you have online everywhere streaming video. You have not only looms that can weave by themselves, you have the extraordinary ability to create all kinds um, of material goods through robotically controlled programmed machine tools. Um, they would say, look, you have solved the problem of everybody having enough, potentially, so there is no reason why society has to be vicious and focused around exploitation and extraction. And since exploitation and extraction are dangerous and a pain to undertake, if you have enough, if you have enough material goods to live the lifestyle of an Athenian or even of a, you know, um, Tang Dynasty gentleman, why would you possibly want more? And they'd say, okay, you've solved the problem of baking a big enough economic pie. And relative to that, the problem of slicing the pie equitably and then of tasting the pie, of enjoying it, of actually using our immense material wealth and historical perspective to construct a world in which people are happy, healthy, safe, and secure. Those are much smaller problems than the problem you've managed to solve. So they would say, why haven't you produced you know, a utopia? Um, I plundered the title from the most plundered poem of the 20th century, William Butler Yeats's The Second Coming. Um, and his whole point is, you know, the second coming is supposed to be something absolutely marvelous, utopian, glorious, the kingdom of heaven brought down to earth. But it's not working out that way. 
Pinocchio. Instead of some great creature of light and happiness, instead there is simply a rough beast that is slouching toward Bethlehem and toward its birth. And when the second coming appears, it will not be what we wanted and not be what we like. And you know, that that really is us. Um, you look back at a world in which the typical standard of living from 6,000 BC up until sometime in the 1800s was what the World Bank would call on the edge of dire poverty, something like maybe 250 a day, $900 a year. You look at the world today with an average income per capita level of $14,000 per year. Um, we look forward to a world in 2100 of $50,000 per year as the average living. And we have no confidence that the world then will be much more utopian um, than our world is today. Now, it is certainly true that we no longer have to watch our children die in infancy and young childhood in huge numbers. And it is certainly true today that we do not spend a great deal of time thinking about how hungry we are or how wet we are or how cold we are. And those are marvelous, marvelous things. No, but indeed, Aristotle or Sir Francis Bacon or Tommaso Campanella or indeed pretty much anyone else or Karl Marx would think that with the immense social power we have, we ought to have produced something much, much, much better than we have. And the question is, why not? And I think the answer is simply that the pace of technological progress has been too fast for us to successfully build the institutions to create a truly human world. Let, let me ask you about the, the end of that story then, right? So you end the your view of the long 20th century pretty much after the Great Recession. Um, mm -hmm. And early in our conversation, you were describing the U.S. as probably a society that's going towards a stagnation in a kind of like natural process, I felt. Um, how do you think about that? Like what's what's that story well, in your head uh, going like forward, well, right? You know, uh, is the West from, from going towards yeah, stagnation? From, yeah. From 1870 to 2010, you could say that the technological capability of human society was doubling every generation. You could say that the United States was a civilization that was at the point of the spear that was leading the way into the future. You could say that we were acquiring more and more knowledge about how to build better institutions and better manage the economies that we had. You could say that we were moving toward a more peaceful and a more international law governed world. But, you know, starting around 2006 or so, hopes that you could maintain the pace of technological advance at its 20th century pace fell away, and that it looks like we now not, do not have 2% per year as the rate of advance of the technological frontier, but only 0.7% per year, a two-thirds fall in what was the 20th century norm. Um, certainly no one in China or elsewhere thinks the United States is an advanced civilization, the point of the spear worth emulating, leading its way into the future. Certainly no one believes after the Great Recession that we're getting much better at designing economic institutions for our economies to maintain stable prosperity. Um, certainly after, you know, George W. Bush's decision that why not pick up a little country like Iraq and throw it against the wall, not because Saddam Hussein was aligned with Al Qaeda, but just because we could, um, belief that we're moving toward a more law governed world was gone and definitely is now completely gone after this spring. And the idea that we had you know, the political institutions to support rational governance, I think those went out the window with the neo-fascist revival in the global north in the 2010s, and not just in the global north. You know, Bolsonaro is, I think, a very scary person. Um, so is Modi. So is Xi Jinping. That all the hopes for utopian progress that you could at least believe yourself, believe were there as... <laughs> 
more than illusions have kind of dropped away over the past 20 years. And we look forward to a future in which we have so far completely failed to deal with the civilizational challenge of global warming. Um, and in which at least hopes that wealth would bring us to social utopia now look to be revealed as largely vain. And so the 21st century will be a different story than the 20th one, right? The 20th century is the century of successfully figuring out how to bake a big enough economic pie and thinking that if only we try hard enough, we can figure out how to solve the slicing and tasting problems. You know, the 21st century will have other concerns and other central focuses and other grand narratives. Can, can I ask you to speculate a bit uh, about that? How do you see the future of the world? And here I want you to, to tell me a bit about what you see of places outside the US and Western Europe. You mentioned already China. Do you think that's yeah. something that could happen is a uh, switch in uh, the leader of technological progress and, 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 and production? Or how, how do you see this? It certainly could. Certainly Xi Jinping thinks it will. Um, there has always been the embarrassing secret that you know, market economies are actually relatively bad at providing incentives for investment and technological progress at proper scale. You know, that the market is absolutely excellent at crowdsourcing solutions to a huge amount of resource allocation problems. But the problem of figuring out how to fund R&D, well, you know, um, if you don't have intellectual property rights, it doesn't happen. If you do have intellectually property rights, then things that ought to be widely distributed aren't. And so there ought to be some different set of institutions. Um, we have the right institutions for science. That is, what you get is not wealth by selling what you produce, but prestige by having been the first to discover. And so everyone has an incentive to work as hard as possible and then publicize it as broadly as possible. And that works for science, that works for research, but does not work for development. You know, well, not, not really. Um, you know... So, yeah, there could be another kind of leading succession. There could be an alternative, you know, kind of, I don't want to say clash of civilizations, but I'd say wrong, but rather of different civilizational growth poles with different kind of senses of direction. Um, I guess the answer is I've spent so much time back in the 20th century that I find I cannot speculate well about what the next generation is going to bring. Um, I will say that there is a sense and that the story of the global north, the story I've told in my book is a very much a global north centric story. Um, that the real story, when people a hundred years from now write the history they will start it in 1976 with the accession to power of Deng Xiaoping and the neoliberal turn in the global south. And they will say that the global south was hobbled for a century and a half, first by colonialism, and then by the dreams of socialism imposed on it by the Soviet Union on the one hand and the British Labour Party on the other. You know, whether you know, Fidel Castro or Mao Zedong or even you know, Jawaharlal Nehru and his license Raj. Um, you know, that those kept the global south from figuring out what institutions it needed to actually adopt industrial technologies. And that starting in 1976 with the accession of Deng Xiaoping, um, the Washington Consensus, the coming of Rajiv Gandhi to India in the 1980s, um, the successful neoliberal turn in the global south, the end of African retardation around 2000, that 1980 to 2100 actually saw not just the global north, but the entire world become rich and become rich without the assumptions that you had to actually copy Victorian Englishmen. 
in order to figure out how to be rich and run institutions. Um, and thus that my book will be an interesting footnote, but in the end, pretty unimportant because it was just you know, the coming of modern economic growth to a small part of the world that is in any event now a very small part of world population. So I guess a right. good way to get back to like the conversation mm -hmm. um, is to wrap up a bit your last answer regarding how this book about the 21st yeah. century would be focused on on well, other things book, that would start in yeah in 1970 the book is around. That we establish international peace and international law, and such bizarre misadventures as the Russian attack on Ukraine on the grounds that we don't um, that the Ukrainians aren't really a nation and should stop pretending that they are that those things come to an end. And that we have a situation in which the predominance of the great powers is acknowledged, but nobody really cares that much about what national boundaries are, that people are happy to live in linguistic communities and otherwise live and let live, that we successfully deal with global warming and that we spread high productivity industrial civilization to the whole world and don't have the scandal of our current 500 million in the global poorest parts of the global south who live like our pre-industrial ancestors. And that humanity is coming to civilized adulthood to a truly human world is the story of what happens from 1980 to 20 to 2100. And maybe there was some worry about global warming when the monsoon failed for five years in a row in South Asia. Um, but we managed to get through that. Um, that's the world that I hope to see um, over the next 80 years or so. Whether we'll actually see that world is in our hands. That would be a good world and it would be a great book, the one that would tell that story. Let me ask you one final question uh, that yeah. I ask all my guests, which is why writing a book? And usually this comes in the context of... Uh, um, of a discipline like economics, but other social sciences that are increasingly focused on writing articles and journals, right? But uh, writing a book is a very difficult task. You already described your interaction yep. with your editors. Yep. Why did yep. you write this book and not uh, do other things with your life? Or, well, as or I say, difficulty to transmit your ideas is definitely the there. Difficulty is definitely there. The difficulty of an argument seems to go up with the square of the number of pages to try to produce something that people can then grab their thinkers and sink into. Um, but the benefits, if you actually write a book, it's, it's, are correspondingly great in terms of teaching people things and shaping people's thoughts. Um it seemed we had lots of histories of the Industrial Revolution and even histories of the entire global economy, um, of which my current favorite is still Greg Clark's A Farewell to Alms. But that there really was something very different happened that happened starting in 1870, um, the coming of what Simon Kuznets called modern economic growth. And that you know, we truly needed something that would be, you know, not a piece for the occasion or something to win a prize or two, but rather would be a treasure for all time. Um, and that the only person writing it who was even half successful was Eric Hobsbawm with his Age of Extremes, and I really did not like the grand narrative of that book. Um, so then I found myself in the position of wanting to read a book and finding that nobody had written it. And so eventually my reaction was first to wonder if I should and then to make some stages at, you know, attempts at starting and then putting it aside for a while and then deciding, yeah, I really should do this. Very much why Noah Smith and I do our podcast. Um, there weren't enough podcasts that we liked listening to. So we thought we should make the podcast we would like to listen to. And I thought I should write the book that I would like to read. And, you know, so I did. And thanks to a very good team of, you know, editors and publicists and, you know, compositors and so forth, it's actually going to be out on September 6th. And I truly do think, although it is wholly inadequate to the subject, it is almost surely the best thing I 
will ever write and does indeed have a great chance of becoming um, not just, as I said, a piece of the occasion or something to win a prize or two, but rather a treasure for all time. Um, and if it does manage to break through to that extent, That's... I will be extremely happy and grateful. It's great. I really enjoy reading your book. Uh, I think it's mm -hmm. a great contribution. And right. um, I, I'm sure that many people would enjoy yeah. it too. Thanks a lot for being here with us. And please write to me and tell me what I've gotten big time wrong in it. Right? Um, that is, I'm eager to learn where I've gotten things wrong. Yeah. Um, so far, I think the only two I will, factual I will. have been I've added a Vaughn to Paul Hindenburg's name and that I put the city of Dalian in the wrong Chinese province. I put it in Shandong, Shandong rather than Liaoning. But there are other thematic and interpretive mistakes um, that I'm sure I have made. And I already have very nice critical letters from Fred Block and from Jerry Friedman and would like to have many, many more. So please write one. I will, I will. Okay. Thanks, Brad.